Hi all, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I'm your host, Liv. Well, another day, another non-Odyssey episode. What will it be today? Oh, what's that? You already know because I put it in the episode title? Damn, spoilers much? Nerds, today I'm coming to you from my new podcast corner. I really hope the acoustics are okay and I don't have to do podcast ghost again, but we'll see. I know this doesn't mean that much to you all, but I'm so happy to be in this new apartment and it's hopefully a place I'll stay for a while because I'm so over moving. Been having a lot of trouble finding a place where I'm happy, both in terms of cities and homes in those cities. It's been stressful. And other than having this podcast and you amazing listeners, I've been kind of drifting. I'm hoping this place where I can house all my beautiful mythological things and live comfortably with my lovely podcast cat will give me the happiness and energy to put more into the podcast, but also some other projects I really hope to bring to you all very soon. Okay, enough with the personal stuff. On to... Today's story comes from both my beloved Ovid and Robert Graves' Greek mythology. Lord knows Ovid's version is better, more beautiful, and wonderful, and oh, how I love Ovid. So yes, you guessed it. That means we're going with the Roman names for the gods. Or really just the Roman name for Dionysus. God of wine and revelry and honestly just madness in general. Or, as we'll call him today, Bacchus. There's a reason we have the word Bacchanalia, you know. Mini myth. I ain't saying he's a gold digger, but Midas is messing with, well, gold. Midas is the son of a goddess, though I've had trouble figuring out who. His father was a satyr, again, whose name I don't know. Oh, those satyrs, though, little troublemakers. As a child, the lifestyle Midas would live and become accustomed to was foretold when it said, A line of diligent ants would bring up food to the side of his cradle, one by one placing the pieces into his mouth as he slept, as a baby. Decadent AF. When he grows older, Midas becomes the king of a region in Macedonia, and just as those little ants might have known all along, he is all about little life pleasures. Self-care, we might call it today. Okay, not really. Maybe what Midas is about is a little more than self-care. One day, a particularly infamous satyr, Silenus, stumbles into Midas' kingdom. And I say stumbled, quite literally, because, you see, Silenus had wandered off from his drunken orgy-style party with Bacchus's followers. He'd fallen asleep, as drunk people do, and was found by Midas's people and brought before him. Silenus tells Midas a story about a region far from Europe, unattached completely, where giants live in the most envious conditions. Amazing cities with an incredible legal system where everyone lives long lives of happiness and contentment. He tells Midas that an expedition once went in search of these people, these Hyperboreans, but when they learned that this was indeed an incredible and and envious as it seemed, They returned in disgust at their own civilization. Ugh. Plus, Silenus adds somewhat anticlimactically, there was this crazy whirlpool en route that no one could get past. Hmm, sounds familiar. And not only that, Silenus says, there are also these streams and trees by those streams. One of the trees grows fruit that if you eat it, you cry and groan and just pine until the end. But then the other tree grows fruit that restores you to youth. But it doesn't just make you a nice young age and keep you there or let you grow old again. No, it restores your youth and then you grow backwards, Benjamin Button style, until you become a kid again and finally disappear. That is Benjamin Button style, right? I've never actually seen it, but it seems like the right reference to make here. Anyway, Silenus regales Midas with these stories, such incredible stories, so colorful, so filled with concepts no one has ever seen or heard before, even in stories of the gods. Midas is all in on what Silenus has told him. He keeps the satyr there for five days so he can hear every story Silenus has to tell before having guards accompany him back to the drunken orgy from whence he came. When Silenus is returned to Bacchus, 
Bacchus wants to reward Midas for not only keeping his friends safe, but for returning him to his group. Bacchus has been worried he'd been missing one of his favorite drunken revelers. Midas doesn't even have time to think about it, what he wants from Bacchus. He has a wish on the tip of his tongue, and he gets it out the very moment Bacchus asks. I want everything I touch to turn to gold! He blurts out in a rush. What a wish. Midas wished that everything he touches would turn to gold. Now let's just think about this for a second. I know that this is one of the most prolific and widespread stories throughout, I don't even know, all time. This golden touch, this Midas touch. But if we forget about the fact that everyone has heard this one before, is it really a good wish? I mean, I guess if you're greedy as fuck, it is. But I just think even without what I already know about how this turns out, I would have thought to myself... This wish is probably going to backfire. But whatever, hindsight is twenty twenty. am I right? Midas asks Bacchus for this, and the next moment he's touching things and they're turning to gold. The gods are a powerful group. Bacchus, though, realizes that what Midas has asked for isn't going to end well, and surprisingly for our friend Bacchus, he actually feels a bit sorry for Midas. He wishes he'd chosen something else, something less greedy. Bacchus had been intending to reward him for the safekeeping of Silenus, and with this wish, it's not much a reward. But Midas didn't ask for something less greedy, or something smarter, or just, you know, not something quite so insane. No, he asked that everything he touches turn to gold. But not only are the rocks and flowers and the random furniture and crap in his palace turning to gold, literally everything he touches is turning to gold. In Ovid's telling, surprise, surprise, we get some stunning imagery when it comes to describing this new scale of Midas's. Ovid tells us he picks up an apple, and it turns so gold it might as well be one of the Hesperides. And when he washes his hands, well, Ovid tells us that even Danae might have been beguiled by the droplets of gold falling from Midas's hands. Get it? Ovid's making a joke here about how Zeus had sex with Danae in the form of a golden shower, and by God, I will take any excuse to remind you all of that fact. Thank you, Ovid, for enabling me. But it isn't just pretty things Midas can make with his hands, nor sexy golden water droplets. No, even the food he sits down to eat turns to gold, and the water he tries to drink, and so it isn't long before this golden touch is not a gift, but a curse. And Midas is begging to have his powers removed and to be returned to his old self. He's fucking hungry and thirsty, and man, he just cannot sustain this, because, you know, starvation and everything. But Bacchus is also not the one you want to be begging for something like this, because, well, Bacchus is really entertained watching Midas suffer from his stupidly phrased wish. It's hilarious. Hard to say what's ever going through Bacchus's mind. Is he empathetic? Is he constantly messing with people? Is he maybe just always pretty drunk? He's fun regardless. And eventually, through his hearty laughs, Bacchus finally tells Midas to visit the source of the river Pactolus and wash himself there. There and only there he can be freed of this curse Midas does this, traveling to the river and taking a nice, probably not super relaxing bath, and the golden touch is removed, freeing him from the curse he very much brought on himself. Specificity, people. Use specificity in your greed. This river, though, where Midas washes his gold away, even now, Ovid says when he wrote this almost two millennia ago, has flecks of gold in its sand. According to Aristotle, Midas actually died from starvation because everything he touched turned to gold. But Ovid's version is a little more family-friendly.
Oh, wonderful listeners. Thanks for listening to today's mini myth. The Midas Touch, the Golden Touch, all these incredibly well-known concepts come from this story. Now, this is one that, when I was younger at least, I didn't have any idea it came from Greek mythology. It's so iconic and so specific to Midas himself that I would have never thought it was Greek mythology. It sounds more like something you hear to teach you to make good decisions and not make stupid wishes. It's one of those, it's just rarely specified that it's the god of wine that brings us upon Midas. It's one of those old tales. I don't know. Anyway, I've just always found it interesting to learn that it is indeed Greek and not just some sort of generic story that's told. Today's episode also comes from a couple of suggestions I received through the website. So thank you all for those. They came in real handy given I've been crazy busy and needed someone to tell me the story I needed to tell. I didn't have time to figure it out on my own. So oh, thank you all. And thank you all again. Hopefully the acoustics in this podcast corner are good. I sure hope so. But turns out living downtown is loud so far. Uh, We'll see. (laughs) Already I have to turn off my fans in order to record. And goddamn, is it hot in here right now? I'm sweating up a storm. You're all the best. Please rate, review, subscribe if you like the show. If you're mad at me, keep it to yourself, as I always say. You're the best. I'll be back next week with more Odysseus. Oh, Odysseus. I'm Liv, and I do love this shit.